everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here. Welcome to episode 21 of Forensics Talks. Today we're going to be talking about the Boston Marathon bombings, but before we do, we're just going to make a few little announcements here. And uh, first off, I want to give a shout out to the people at the Ontario Police College. This week I was uh, able to stand in on one of the uh, one day of the uh, basic blood stain class and some really good people there. And if you're ch chiming in, thank you very much. A um, couple of things here. Uh, let's see. First one. Yeah, there's a uh, Click 3D photogrammetry class that's happening next week. There's still a few days left if you're interested in registering. This is where uh, I teach you how to use your digital camera to create 3D models. And these 3D models are things you could use for crime scene reconstruction. You can use them for architecture. You can use them for all different areas. It's not just for forensics. Also, uh, there is the American Academy a forensic science conference coming up that's uh, next week, actually the 15th through the 19th. And this is a completely virtual conference. So if you're interested, uh, you can just go to the uh, aafs.org. And oh, almost forgot too. I forgot to give you the link to the course there before, but there it is. You can always uh, go back and check that out. Also, there's the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction Conference that's coming up. Uh, as of a week and a half ago or so, I am going to be speaking there along with some other interesting speakers. So if you are interested in signing up, this one is actually an in-person and a virtual conference. So um, if you're interested, uh, you know, it's, it's open up to people from wherever you are without the need for travel if you don't want to. But if you're dying to see people like many people are, then uh, you can always travel to Telsa. Alrighty, let's get started here. Let me switch some things around and get set up. So today we're going to be talking about the Boston Marathon bombing. And um, this is something that occurred on April 15, 2013, during the 117th annual Boston Marathon. And two homemade pressure cooker bombs detonated at 2.49 p.m. near the finish line of the race and the bombs exploded about 14 seconds and 210 yards or about 190 meters apart, killing three people and injuring hundreds of others, including 17 who lost their limbs. Immediately after the bombing occurred, uh, the injured and the injured were transported. Uh, the police closed a 15 block area around the blast site, and this was reduced to about a 12 block crime scene on April 16th. Evidence that was found near the blast site includes bits of metal, nails, ball bearings, black nylon pieces from a backpack, uh, remains of a circuit board and even wiring. There was a pressure cooker lid that was found on a nearby rooftop, sort of uh, exemplifying the amount of force that was in this blast. And both of the pressure cooker bombs were manufactured by two brothers, Tamerlan and Johar uh, Sarniev. So um, that's going to be the topic of discussion today. And just to give you a feeling for what that looked like, uh, this was recorded on many different streams and you can see it here. The first bomb goes off near the finish line. You can see the finish line at the bottom there. And then it, if you wait about 10 or 15 seconds, you'll hear another bomb that goes off uh, further down uh, into the distance there. And that, the person holding the camera here just kind of turns. There you go, you just heard it. You can just kind of see some of the smoke there. And as you can imagine, it amassed a whole bunch of uh, uh, just pandemonium uh, on that day. And, and I remember when that happened and uh, just a very tragic event. So our speaker today is Michael Connolly, and he's a 24-year uh, veteran of the Boston Police Department. Uh, he started off in patrol. Um, and even a bike officer. But since then, uh, since about 2001, he's been assigned to the crime scene response unit. And he's been the uh, lead training coordinator since 2007. He's been trained as a temperance examiner since 2001. And he's a certified crime scene investigator with the International Association for Identification since 2012. Mike does a lot of training for people. Uh, he's developed uh, training for the newly assigned officers in the crime scene reconstruction unit. And he's also trained like other local, state and federal agencies. Uh, he was also a lead developer of the regional agency practical intelligence and investigative drill. And the short for that is RAPID, which is a multi-agency investigative exercise uh, that included Boston and eight other surrounding cities and towns. RAPID was a two-day exercise created specifically for investigators uh, that challenges their knowledge and information gathering technology and their ability to communicate with other agencies to achieve a common goal. And as you can imagine, for the Boston Marathon bombing, this is a really important uh, part of everything. 
He's also the lead instructor for the Advanced Forensic Investigations for Hazardous Environments for the National Center for Biomedical Research and Training at Louisiana State University. And he's also the lead instructor with the State Department's International Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program, where he teaches terrorist crime scene investigations. Um, he's been fortunate to work with people from all over the world, like Peru, Jordan, Indonesia. And so uh, on that note, Mike, uh, welcome and thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Eugene. All right. Um, I want to start off by asking you um, your history. And, and just before you were working with the police department, uh, were you doing something else? And how did you uh, get into policing? Yeah, that's um, it's not quite a straight line. I uh, went to school for special ed and elementary education. So I became a teacher, an elementary and um, uh, middle school teacher for a, a few years. Um, I was pursuing that job, trying to get a public school job, uh, and it was tough. Um, however, uh, I always wanted to, to be a police officer. I have it in the family, my father, my uncle, um, I have siblings who are police officers. So there's a strong lineage there. And I had the opportunity to uh, take the police exam while I was teaching and uh, thankfully got on. So it's it's been about 24 years now. but. Um, that's kind of the not the, not such a quite a straight line from uh, into law enforcement, but yeah. How long were you in for uh, patrol for? Uh, four years. You're four years. Four years. Yeah. Okay. And, and what was it? Uh, just a position that opened up, or was it something that you were interested in? Like you, like yeah, I want to get into the crime scene unit. Yeah. So uh, oddly enough, Eugene, Boston didn't have a crime scene uh, unit really, uh, a fully fledged crime scene unit back then. We were the ID and photography unit so id and photos so um so when i when uh, when i came over in 2001 um there's a lot of old timers there and um they were trying to just bring in some youth and so uh i had a classmate who was there and he said you know the work is fun it's interesting we're always learning so um that's when i made the leap um and then the the history of uh forming our unit kind of happened in 2004 and kind of a couple of worlds collided where um, an, there was an arrest uh, back in 97 where a police officer was shot with his own gun. Um, the suspect uh, went into a house or an apartment, um, allegedly touched some uh, glass and left some DNA with a hat. And uh, based on that, as well as uh, the police officer's familiarity with the, the person, they made an ident um, based on, you know, witness and fingerprints. They made an arrest. Guy goes to jail. Years later, through the Innocence Project, they said, well, wait a minute, that's not his fingerprint. And sure enough, it wasn't. So, um, which, as you know, in uh, the fingerprint world is, you know, is a mortal sin. So what happened was... Uh, between that and our homicide unit, you know, uh, begging for a crime scene, a 24 hour crime scene unit, we kind of um, took both those events and said, this is a time and let's uh, bring in some more people. And, you know, so now we have a, a unit of roughly 27 sworn at full capacity. Uh, we're a 24 hour 365 type of unit. Um, and and boy has it changed over the years <laughs> yeah no kidding um I, I had no idea that that was the case uh that that's how it started so that, that's interesting i thought it's boston i thought they've always had a, a crime scene unit you know, you know it's just an, it seems like an obvious thing um we actually met at the uh california association of criminalists and that's where you that's where you did the presentation and otherwise i wouldn't have known about you so actually i have to thank mike russ uh from san bernardino for uh making the, intro, uh, the introduction there and uh Good man, um, and the follow-up. He is absolutely, um, and I think uh, part of part of what struck me with your presentation was uh, it was actually just a really honest and down-to-earth presentation about the real-life challenges that you were faced with, and and even others uh, were faced with. So, uh, so let, I guess let, I want to focus on the investigation part, like the 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 document. Uh, the documentation and sort of the um, maybe some of the interagency things that came up or whatever. But let's start yeah. with uh, where where were you when this first happened? Were you were you were you on call? Were you working? Or what was what was the situation? So you know the marathon is run every year and it's it's run on Patriots Day. It's a holiday for Massachusetts, and usually it's also it also coincides with school vacation. 
So um, you, we have kids and families who are away. Uh, and, and of course, the international draw that the, um, the race brings. So that's a full call out for anybody in the department. Mm -hmm. So um, so we're all on duty um, having, uh, you know, we will rotate all our guys. So most of us who are out on the streets, uh, what our unit will do is we'll be out with video cameras uh, and a team of two and just videotaping um, any type of police interaction or uh, suspicious activity. I happen to be uh, inside covering the calls for the day with a few other guys. Um, so I was uh, at my desk when my boss came over to tell me. And just, uh, I would say about 30 minutes prior, uh, we have two large uh, screens in the, the office, both had the marathon going and you can see pictures of it, but you can see tons on the right and tons on the left of police officers in their high vis vests just lining the streets. And, you know, and I, I remember turning around to one of the guys and just turning and saying, uh, what a waste of manpower, what a waste of money, you know, because the event every year goes off without a hitch. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great family event. Um, and there's very, ever really uh, no real issues there. You know, you know, the yeah. occasional drunken college kids, but, you know, never really huge issues. Now, how far how far are you from the location where it happened? Like, where's the PD or where are you located? Yeah, we're out of headquarters. So we're maybe a mile and a half away. OK, so, so not too bad. Yeah. Easy response time. Okay. But yeah, as you can imagine, uh, we were competing with a lot of other uh, first responders to get there. Yeah. So and I'm, I'm trying to imagine the re you know, you're you're looking at the screens or somebody calls you and you're like, Oh crap. Like, you know what I mean? And then like, you know, how do you get the, the right people there and the, uh, the quantity and number of people that you need uh, to kind of assess the situation and control the situation? I mean, there's, there's pandemonium going on first off because I mean, there were hundreds of people injured, right? There were. And, um, and three people dead at the scene. And um, yeah, so we, uh, when I was told um, to saddle up because uh, there was two explosions at the, the marathon, you know, because we all joke. Yeah, I, I, I instantly laughed. I'm like, yeah, where's the joke there? And my boss said, no, 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 we got to go. And I saw the look in his face and I'm like, oh, shit. All right. So this is real. Yeah. So uh, we just grabbed the guys in the office, grabbed whatever we could, saddled up and shot down. And, you know, knowing that um, arriving at any crime scene, uh, especially something as dynamic as that, there's going to be a time where we have to sit sit back and kind of wait till things die down and then then we can go in and assess. So when we did arrive, um, that's exactly what we did. Um, not to mention that we had um, the rest of our unit spread out throughout the course within the city. So we had to you know reach out to them and let them know, hey, this is where we are. Um, and we actually had, you know, she was uh, in patrol at the time, but uh, we have an officer who was in our unit now and she was actually running the marathon and uh, she was stopped at one point um, by, I think, a Brookline police officer and had to get turned around. And she said, I'm a police officer. You know, can I get a ride to the station? Mm -hmm. And of course, she had no uh, idea or anything on. And she had actually had to run back to the police station, shower up and then get dressed. So she almost finished a full marathon, but then uniformed up and, and yeah. went. Yeah. So it was it, it was. Um, you know, uh, logistically, it, it was a nightmare, and um, uh, we experienced uh, the calls for us because they were trying to call us. We need crime scene here. We need crime scene there. And um, about five or six years prior, uh, we had um, a large crane, uh, oddly enough, fall on that same street, Boylston Street, and um, uh, did some damage to buildings, killed a couple of motorists. Um, so it was pretty. So it was a pretty pretty severe uh, scene. And same thing happened, you know, uh, there was a couple of uh, scenes there that had to be processed and uh, we were getting called and, and we were kind of ping pong and back and, back and forth. And we kind of learned from that uh, scene that, hey, listen, you know, I know you need us. Uh, we're here, we, you know, our thought was we can't fracture. If we start fracturing, we won't have any cohesive, uh, approach to to the scene so we kind of said yeah we're here um 
we know uh, we were trying to form uh, formulate a, a plan, um, and we knew it was bigger than us, you know. And and ultimately, uh, we we never formulated a plan until the next that night or the next day, and, and then uh, then attack the scene. So when you said like when you say we're here, I mean this is not like an apartment. You're staying outside, just kind of waiting. I mean it's it's a huge area. So do you have like you're at one end, there's other people on the other end. Like, how were you situated? Yeah, so we were on Huntington Ave, which is uh, a street that runs parallel to the uh, to Boylston Street, where uh, the marathon finishes and where the explosions occurred. So uh, it was just a natural because you can't access the uh, marathon area. Uh, we uh, all of the first responders, uh, state and local uh, police, as well as uh, EMS ambulances. They all just um, started piling up over um, by one of the hotels uh, just beyond uh, on Huntington Ave, just beyond the uh, the marathon, and uh, so we all uh, we all knew um, uh, we we put out a, a call to our guys to say, hey, this is where we are, and we started uh, meeting, and then when we got calls, you know, for hey, we have a we have a cell phone over here, we have a suspicious package over here. Um, we said, all right, this is where we are, mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll, we'll 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 come when you when when it's necessary, um, and when it's prudent, because it was as you could imagine, it was a very dynamic scene, oh, and, yeah. and you know, um, actually, uh, part of the uh, the international course that we 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 do, we we talk about um, explosives, um, explosions, and uh, po uh, post blast stuff, um, and secondary secondary devices, and uh, we were concerned about secondary devices, and as we were um, find, you know, forming, and we're all parked in this one spot, uh, there were runners who were um, uh, who who had either finished or came off the course, kind of meandering through us, as well as people on bikes with backpacks, and they're zipping through all of these first responders, and so we had to uh, find some tape and just cordon off that area and uh, just for our safety, because it was the, such yeah. a, a, a huge amount of um, uh, traffic, uh, foot traffic coming through us. And you didn't know who was who. And quite honestly, as we were waiting, um, a suspicious package was found and it was detonated. Um, and being, you know, from the outside, just hearing that, because we heard it live in on the radio, it was just kind of eerie. Mm -hmm. And it ended up, you know, thankfully being just um, wires and things for the local news. But um, people were, of course, they were their their um, their spidey senses were up and they wanted to make sure that everything was safe. Yeah. I mean, there was I'd seen I mean, there's some images, obviously, there's a lot of footage on this particular incident. So uh, one of them that I saw, I mean, there's just stuff everywhere. I mean, there's stuff. That's, I mean, there's little bits and pieces. And I'm thinking, my God, like. Where do you start on something like that? So how did how did you prioritize? How did you team up? What was what was the uh, and then of course I guess we got to talk about at some point how you were you know there's there's other agencies that were assisting here so maybe you can lead into some of that. Yeah, sure. So you know that night um, traditionally it, that that time of year uh, down that street um, it's very windy and uh, it can bring in a very cold breeze. And a pretty stiff breeze, so uh, that uh, that night was no different. And so there was a pretty chilly breeze and a strong breeze coming through. And as you could imagine, um, I you know I equate it to like a uh, you know some sci-fi movie that you know it looked like people were just zapped into space because you had and, and these uh, patios outside the restaurants, platters full of food and a full beer and someone's uh, tip money and, and bill money just right there. Um, and that night, what happened because of that, just everything kept blowing. And a lot of that stuff was being, sorry, well, a lot of that stuff was being blown um, down the street. So while that's being done, uh, we are formulating a plan. You know, the, the, the higher ups are formulating a plan in one of the local uh, hotels. Um, you know, local, state, and federal agencies started coming together. So um, that that night, um, actually early the next morning, uh, about two in the morning, a few of us um, were tasked with uh, 
recovering the bodies of the deceased. We had uh, three uh, people who were killed on the scene. Um, so we, we wanted to be able to uh, process that area and take care of uh, the, the, the deceased. And then um, saddle up the next morning, uh, that morning and, um, and devise a plan. So <clears throat> um, just like any uh, terrorist event, which it was deemed rather quickly, um, yeah, the federal uh, federal agencies will take over. So FBI took over. It's it's you know it's their scene, and so the next morning, um, uh, Boston um, State and some federal agencies, uh, namely FBI, ATF, um, met at uh, the hotel, the Lenox Hotel, which was our point of operation. And um, if anybody's visiting Boston, I can't speak enough uh, about the Lenox because it, it, how they treated us and what they did for us. Um, it, it was amazing, uh, the kindness uh, in people when uh, things like this happen. And the Lenox has always been like this. But Is, is that the building that's sort of across from the second, where the second bomb, bomb went off? Exactly. Okay, yeah. Exactly. And uh, and it was great. It was it was our base of operation. So we... Um, we, we formulated teams, we broke up into teams and, um, you know, uh, luckily, uh, and this is where um, reaching out um, to other agencies and training with other agencies really came into play. We, um, at the time, were trying to form um, a C. Bernie team um, within our crime scene unit. And it was based off the LSU course that uh, we, had, we had taken which I now teach for. Um, and so we reached out to the FBI and the SC Bernie team and met with some folks and, and had, had, we toured their facility and um, we were going to do some training together. And, um, you know, life happened and we just never hooked up. Um, however, we had names and faces that sounded and looked familiar and we were able to kind of talk to um, some of those folks um, the day of the bombing. Um, and you know, we had a, uh, a commander who was, um, there's no bones about him. And he said, just to let you know, um, whatever goes on here, our people will be a part of it. And so he, 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 he muscled his way in and um, we became part of the scene, which you know, I'm forever grateful for because um, uh, not everybody had that opportunity um, mm -hmm. to be part of it. And, and that's um, one of the, the, uh, the learning points from uh, this incident for uh, I think Boston as a whole that, you know, we will moving forward be an active participant uh, in anything like this if it have, ever happens again. Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, equipment or resources or that sort of thing, what were some of the first things that you were like, we, we need this or we need more of this or, or whatever, what kind of things hit you right away? So, uh, you know, typical crime scene stuff, right? So, um, and this is going to be, uh, uh, it sounds like a shameless plug for that, uh, our LSU class, but it, it really isn't based on that class and, the, and based on the fact that we were trying to become uh, a C. Bernie team within our crime scene unit, we had um, uh, PPE gear um, fit for uh, post blast. So we had, um, Tyvek suits. We had the booties. We had the gloves. We had the masks. Um, we had some sifting gear. So um, I can, you know, um, proudly say that we uh, um, clothed the the scene for the first couple of days. Um, so all of our stuff just went out uh, because you know the FBI um, has some great resources and they brought those resources in, but it took a couple of days. So. When those resources came in, um, again, you had the Tyvek suits, the gloves, the booties, um, rakes, shovels, um, and things that we didn't have uh, readily accessible. We um, reached out to other partners like uh, the Boston Water and Sewer folks. We needed sifters because we started sifting through um, the muck in the sewer systems and, and things like that. So we were able to... Um, not only tap into our stuff and the uh, FBI who brought their stuff, which was great, but some of our partners where, um, you know, our everyday partners that um, people have to realize they can be a huge part of, uh, you know, a huge scene like a, a bombing. 
And so, uh, it, it, there were other, uh, so was it just the FBI or did you get assistance from other agencies? Yeah, we did have, we had uh, assistance from a lot of agencies. Uh, you know, people really stepped up, you know, couldn't, you know, I, I don't think uh, words can express how great um, all of the first responders and the, the folks coming in afterwards uh, were. Um, just people wanted to help. So we had the FBI, we had ATF, um, and we had uh, state, we had local, um, and and there were other federal agencies. There was so many jackets with letters on it. You know, I thought it was in an episode of Sesame Street uh, because, right? Because and I'm like, you know, is does that say like, you know, is that uh, from the post office? Is that postal police? You know, it's like, what's postal police doing here? Yeah. However, just people wanted to help, and you know, for your listeners and your viewers. Um, especially those who are in this field and maybe looking to get into the field. Um, the folks that you meet, like you and, and Mike and, you know, from around the country, you know, I got calls from San Bernardino. I got calls from Florida. I got calls from New York. I got calls from um, Wisconsin um, and just people offering to help. And these are people I've met um, and maybe had a beer with at a conference and kind of talk shop. Um, so, um, we, we had a lot of physical as well as moral support and and it, it was huge it, it was it was huge to know to, for me to know that um, someone had my back they were thinking about me and they had my back and they you know well enough to call me or text me and so, yeah so how much time uh, I mean the, the whole investigation lasted like five days until they arrested the uh well, the one brother died and there was in a shootout and then they arrested the set, the second brother, the younger brother. But um, were you on the scene for how long? Uh, right. Yeah. So right to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, we started processing. Um, so the marathon is on a Monday morning. We started processing Tuesday morning. And just like any crime scene, um, we started documenting through photography and, and notes. And, and that took a while. You know, it just the overall photographs. So we had to document the scene like it like it was any other scene. Just the size and the scope was a lot different than we used to. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and we spent a, a good part of that week doing that. And physically, we were down um, on Boylston Street and the surrounding area for about eight straight days. Wow. Just processing, documenting. Um, and, you know, collecting and, and documenting, really. Uh, we also had uh, from all of the victims um, who showed up at the ho uh, hospitals. Uh, and thankfully, we were in the area where we have so many hospitals and, uh, and a small radius from that finish line. All, the, all of that clothing um, now became evidence. And all of those started coming in. And we had to commandeer a... Um, a black falcon pier down by the waterfront where uh, the cruise ships come in and put everybody's luggage so they, they were able to uh, use, utilize that and um open that up to uh collecting the collection of the uh the evidence coming in from not only from the hospital but from also also from the scene yeah did you do anything like uh like laser scanning or anything like that at that time yeah so so boston you know we were um relegated to, uh, you know, just noting, uh, documenting through photography. Um, the FBI had total station. Um, I think they had total station. They had a Pharaoh, they had a Leica, they had a Regal, which is a fancy one. I think that was in the air. So, uh, from what I understand, they, they used every type of scanning source they could and, and they did it, but mainly, um, um, and this is your, your world, but mainly they were using the total station. Um, and you know, it, that took a long time, you know, cause they went from every piece of marked evidence. Um, and at, that took days and you know, God love the two who did that. The two, two out from our side, you know, we, we, we separated the crime scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, they were separated from, you know, from the first blast, which was at the finish line. And then the second blast, which was over by the forum restaurant and by the, by the hotel, a little, you know, close to the hotel. So, yeah. um, and it was no different on the other side, but that was a lot of work, as you can imagine. Okay. And in terms of the kinds of things that you're finding, I mean, you mentioned, obviously, there's just like personal effects of different people or whatever. What about the the bomb itself? I mean, I understood that they they put 
everything in their BBs and nails. And I mean, this stuff must have gone everywhere. And I mean, there's even x-rays online that show people that still have, you know, uh, BBs in their, in their bodies and stuff like that. So, uh, what, uh, what kind of things were you finding at least with respect to the bomb fragments from the bomb itself? So, you know, uh, you know, there's no question what these two brothers wanted to do. And, uh, we were finding, and, you know, in your introduction, um, you, you, you mentioned it, but we were finding, uh, BBs, uh, small nails or brads. Um, obviously we found, uh, shards and pieces of black backpacks. We found pieces, small and large pieces of the pressure cooker. Um, and then we were finding, uh, small, uh, pieces of, uh, of this rubbery substance. And, and I, I, I forget the, I forget the color. I want to say maybe it's a red color, but, um, or white. And, uh, we're trying to figure out what it was. And then we, we started finding more and more and there was, there were dimples in them. And we're like, Oh, what they did was cocked the inside of, uh, what I believe it happened is they cocked the inside of that pressure cooker and um, that's where they put all the brads and all the BBs. Um, so so you, we were finding that everywhere. Um, after taking care of the lower portion of Boylston Street, you know, we, we, we got a uh, fire truck and went up and checked awnings and rooftops. And we were finding uh, pieces of the shrapnel up there as well. Oh yeah, you can see it in the video. There's there's stuff that's that's just going straight up, like piece. Of, it must be pieces of the bomb or maybe something else that it hit. But there's there's stuff that's flying up in the air. And so I was, I was uh, pretty impressed when they said that they found a part of one of the the, the I guess the pot or the pressure pot or whatever it is uh, up on the roof. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. These uh, these are pretty serious and. Uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine uh, what happens. I mean, I'm trying to figure, you know, you can see the guy in the video and, and uh, I should, I, I want to ask about the video too, because that's obviously a big component of the uh, collection aspect. And I'm not sure who handled all of that, but that that must've been a huge undertaking, uh, just the, the video analysis and everything else. But, you know, I was amazed to see this young guy, you know, one of them, I think it was the younger brother. And, you know, he walks up and he's in this crowd of people and, He's got to make the decision of where to put this bomb. And here there's a family in front of him and a young boy in front of him and stuff like that. And he can just, you know, leave it down in front of them and then just kind of walk away. You know, it's just absolutely incredible. But um, anyway, let me let me ask you about the video part of all of this. Uh, were you involved at all in or familiar at all with the video aspect? So we weren't involved with um, combing the video. Um but, uh, you know, a good friend of mine out of homicide, he was in uh, down. They, they took a portion of that uh, interior of the of Black Falcon Pier and kind of set up um, a space where people were combing through all types of video from, you know, fixed CCTV to um, news footage. Uh, and they put out a plea. You know, I think our social media impact really picked up thankfully during this time because they were asking for everything and, and they were keeping people um informed but um uh yeah uh they they had a space down at black falcon pier and as described to me it was an alphabet soup of of folks you know um pouring through all that video um and they were down there for a couple of days um and you know the story goes is that uh you know they were pouring through it and uh, one of the federal agencies um, started acting a little differently after someone came over and mm -hmm. uh, everybody's kind of looking at them and saying what's going on and, and their behavior kind of changed the way they were kind of searching and after nothing being said and some time going by, a couple of the agencies came over to the other agency and said, hey, what, you, do you have something? What's going on? And at first they denied it, but then they finally had to give it up and said, yeah, this, these are the two we're looking for, which, you know, very frustrating yeah. um, and the folks in the room, I guess, you know, many as told to me by uh, a buddy uh, so much. So uh, the frustration was so bad that a lot of them just closed their laptops and, and left. Well, there was something I, I saw on, uh, I saw on YouTube or whatever, that there was something where it was kind of a surprise to people because they, they show the, they show the footage through the news or the media. And I think it was the, someone at the FBI says, Hey, we got, these are the guys or whatever. And I don't know if that was planned or if it was a mistake or, or, or what the deal was, 
uh, during the investigation. Um, but is, is that is that kind of your understanding of what happened? Yeah, I think I think that was a little bit of a bone of contention. You know, do we put these uh, these uh, unknown faces out? Um, you know, and, and um, so I know there was some, uh, and that was uh, a job grades much higher than me that were making these decisions and fighting those fights. But from what I understand, that was that was a little bit of an issue. You know, and then ultimately, you know, um, I know the older brother was known to the FBI, um, so mm-hmm. he, he was known, and, and just. Um, something fell through the cracks there. Um, but, uh, it was, it was, you know, it was a lot of frustration, um, from, uh, you know, the interagency, uh, dynamic was a little taxed at times, you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah. um, and thankfully, you know, uh, from our point of view, like, uh, we were able to stick to doing what we were doing on the ground. And ultimately that's what we were. We were there, like I said, for eight days. And when, Ultimately, the uh, the scene boiled over into a surrounding town, into Watertown, where they had the shootout, and um, uh, we still were down at the scene. Um, and that morning of the you know the night and the next morning of that shootout, showing up to the crime scene um, and finding out what happened on the radio on the ride in was uh, it was you know just eerie. And then walking to our crime scene where it was usually buzzing with help. We didn't have the help because everybody was there and on the other one. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, from a police officer point of view, the sick feeling in my stomach, you know, thinking and, and, you know, hoping that it doesn't happen, but just thinking, you know, are there going to be more cops killed because, yeah. you know, uh, poor officer from, uh, MIT was, was assassinated. And, yeah. and, and, you know, we heard stories about uh, guys getting bombs thrown at them, big and small, you know, uh, pressure cookers being thrown at them at that scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, from that scene, we, you know, we, unfortunately, we, we lost uh, our own, one of our own police officers a year later from um, yes. traumatic brain injury. So, um, and he, and he didn't know it. So it's, you know, um, so it, it was, it was scary scene there, but um, very eerie where we were, but we knew uh, that we had to continue on. And was because- the, uh, the, the, it, was it a police, an MIT, was it a, like an MIT police is that police, officer. A police officer. So did, did he like recognize them or something? Or do you know the story there? I, I'm not familiar with what happened, but what was it just, they felt like killing somebody or what was the deal there? Yeah. So uh, the police officer's name is Sean Collier, a young kid who always wanted to be a police officer. And he, he became a police officer. And, and um, from my understanding and, and not etched in stone, but I think they approached him. Um, and, you know, there was a rumor that they were trying to get his gun. So, um, they, they assassinated him and, and, you know, there was a rumor of them trying to get his gun. I think there was a rumor that they actually got his gun, but I don't think that's true. But mm. um, I think that was their goal. Um, okay. And soon after that, I think, uh, which was their, you know, the, their demises, they uh, hijacked a car. Um, right. And, you know, that brave soul who was uh, carjacked, um, as they t- get in gas, he just ran. A, re- he, he left. He he escaped and was able to really um, uh, start the, the chain of events that ended up uh, getting these two. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw one of the uh, one of the videos on that and how he, he makes a beeline for another gas station and he's terrified. You can see that. I mean, you can see that he runs into the thing and he's like covering, you know, behind, you know, crouching down and you know the the guy at behind the counter is like, what the hell is going on here, right? Yeah, and there's a and, language barrier. Yeah, no. that too. Yeah. It was a language um, so getting back to the evidence, do you know how many pieces of evidence you actually collected? I don't. I don't. I, I guess I should try to find those numbers from um, the, the uh, FBI. But ultimately, any uh, photographs, uh, any evidence was supposed to go to the FBI. Um, and so um, and the way it was situated uh, down at the scene. Um, uh, and this is was kind of our workflow. Uh, you know, we would uh, mark and identify evidence. Uh, we would photograph that evidence using our overall mid-range and close-up techniques. And ultimately, someone would come behind us um, and collect it. And then there was, uh, we took a, a storefront, I think, and used that as the evidence collection area. And so anytime they had uh, evidence, they'd bring it over to the evidence custodian did check it in. So, you know, the uh, chain of custody was uh, pretty good there. So, um, 
and then ultimately uh, it, it, it was uh, sent off to the, the feds. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest piece of evidence they got um, was probably uh, the boat where the younger brother was found in, yeah, in Watertown. Right. Yeah. So that ended up at the Black Falcon Pier. I believe, you know, one or two of their cars ended up there. Maybe the hijacked or the carjacked uh, Mercedes was there. So, yeah, no kidding. I can imagine the, uh, or at least I'm trying to imagine the uh, the amount of processing and the number of different people that had to jump on this thing. I mean, like, do you imagine it's on the order of thousands of pieces of evidence or? Oh, yeah. It's got to be, right? Yeah, thousands. You better yeah. believe it. And, and, you know, uh, processing, that was my first and only post blast scene I've ever done. So um, it was unique to me. It was new to me. And um, it, there was a learning curve. Uh, you know, I, I, I always tell a story that I, I was, I was kind of butting heads with one of the FBI bomb techs because, you know, we, you know, forensically we'll do it one way. And then the bomb techs, they have a different approach. Um, ultimately uh, we became good friends at the end of the week. And, and, and we kind of talked about how we, we do things. Um, but it, it was very foreign to, you know, a crime scene person that, uh, why are you doing this? Um, they would pick up, uh, they'd find like items. So you could imagine the amount of brads or BBs that were there. And mm -hmm. I'm watching, you know, these uh, FBI folks just pick up BBs and put them in a pile somewhere. And then they were going to photograph that. I'm like, what? <laughs> this is, this is beyond anything that I was ever taught. Um, but, you know, it's part of post blast. So, um, so it was, it was a learning event. Um, and, uh, I, you know, and it, it, it worked, you know, um, we, we made it work. Um, well, we speaking of make it work. So you, let's talk about training for a second, because, you know, there's, uh, the stuff you're doing at, uh, Louisiana state and with the, uh, anti-terrorism assistance stuff and, and some of the other training up until that point, what training had you had, uh, that helped you with something of this, you know, this, uh, this type of a scene, a, a blast scene or, or whatever. And, uh, what have you done since? So, uh, we, we, I, our unit, uh, and, and I was part of that. We, we benefited from all kinds of great training prior to this. Um, one was the LSU training that, um, teaches you how to process a crime scene in a, um, a hazardous environment, uh, whether it's biological, chemical, this happened to be explosive. Um, but um, we had free training uh, through grants uh, through the NIJ down at the NFSTC in, in Florida when they used to bring people in for training. And so we had um, uh, through federal programs, uh, free programs, as well as uh, folks that we would bring in or go to your everyday typical crime scene um, investigation training, um, which was of huge help. And huge benefit. Um, we uh, we used what we had learned. Um, some of the techniques in, that we learned through LSU and some other training um, down at some programs uh, down at uh, Fort McClellan um, in Alabama, uh, we used bits and pieces of what we were taught down at the Marathon bombing. And um, I was I was personally I was happy to have not only have received that training, but was able to remember my training and put it into action. And what I did uh, after the marathon, sometime weeks later, I, when kind of the dust settled and we had some time to ourselves, I kind of shot an email and a note to a lot of these um, folks who had trained us, especially the free ones. And because at that time they were talking about just ending the free training and defunding the training. And I said, listen, I used your training we used your training down at the, this, these bomb sites, and um, I'll be glad to write and call and show up to any uh, politician that you need me to, and, and to to promote your product because it did help us. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, any type of training you can get, you know, crime scene training, the forensics, it helped. It helped. Um, and since then, uh, we were able to work with folks through uh, New Mexico Tech. Um, there is free training there in their post blast. Okay. Um, and I was able to work a deal out with them. Um, and the boss gave the okay where we could send um, uh, one person from each shift. So we have three shifts, a 24 hour program. Um, we were able to send people to uh, New Mexico to get some post blast training. And we, we, you know, I think we maybe got through half the squad and, and I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go last because, um, 
for whatever reason. And then we got a new boss and the uh, new boss said, uh, that's enough of that. So <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. You know, little stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah. It, and, and so, you know, I, I guess the message is uh, for me, it's like whatever crime scene training you get, uh, you're receiving or you're looking to get, it's going to benefit you. Um, and, um, you know, I always uh, teaching for LSU now in that course that we had taken, we'll introduce ourselves as instructors. And one of the things I make sure to mention that I, I was a student. So I said, I always say I, I was sitting where you are right now. And through the week, you're going to hear a bunch of acronyms and and, you know, things that maybe not make sense. And I remember sitting there saying, I'll never use this stuff. You know, who's going to, you know, I don't expect to get hit with a dirty bomb or, mm -hmm. you know, but sure enough, these techniques that, yeah, it wasn't a dirty bomb. It wasn't a biological agent. But you know what? I, I was able to use these techniques to, to, to process the scene a little bit more efficiently and safely and, you know, holding on to the um holding on to the you know the the purity of the evidence as much as possible okay now the the training that you're doing like there's the the international tr like sort of aspect that you've had you had exposure to different people from different countries was that through like a government program or is, is that just open to different people yep so that's uh through our state department and um what that program is it's the anti-terrorism assistance program and uh we go to uh uh, countries that um, uh, that we have agreements with, we go to countries that we you know we want to maintain friends. We're trying to create some friendships, political friendships, and so we go and teach local law enforcement and forensic folks um, to process crime scenes uh, of a terrorist event. And uh, we are lucky enough where we can bring equipment in. So we'll bring in processing equipment. We'll bring cameras, tripods, and. When we leave, we leave it all there for, um, you know, for the uh, the students. And, you know, it's an amazing uh, because as someone, uh, you know, we're very lucky where we live and we have access to what we need to do the job correctly. Um, and one of the uh, countries that I was at, we're talking to one of the lab folks. He, he was a police officer and he works in the labs. And um, he said, um, is there any way I can have an extra pair of gloves. And I said, sure, why? And he said, because we have to wash out our gloves every time we use them. And yes. so we said, listen, buddy, before you leave, we're gonna pack. So we packed <laughs> a full box, a box of gloves. I said, take them to your lab, but you know, this is what they have to do. And imagine, yeah. you know, the integrity of that evidence. But but here's, here's someone who is working with what he has and he just wants to do the job correctly. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, look, we're getting on here in time and I don't want to push it too much, but look, uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing, you know, the experience with everybody. And, uh, um, I think it's a, it's a great story. It's a very uh, a tragic event, obviously. Um, and, uh, especially in a city like Boston where, you know, you don't expect this kind of thing to happen, just very diverse, very cosmopolitan. And, uh, you know, I've been there a couple of times myself and uh, it's, a, it's a great city. So, uh, hopefully that you won't have to deal with that ever again. Yeah, I hope not. I hope not. But thanks for having me. It was it was great talking to you. It's my first right. podcast. So hopefully uh Oh, it's great. Listeners will get some out of it and the viewers. Right on. Well, listen, hang back for a sec. I'll come back to you after and uh, I'm just going to make some closing comments. Thanks, Eugene. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right, everybody. Well, that does it for uh, episode 21. Next week I'm going to have uh, you may have known her as Alice Maceo, but she's now Alice White, and she's going to be talking to us about fingerprints. And uh, she's uh, an excellent trainer. She knows a ton of information, especially on uh, fingerprint dis distortions and that sort of thing. So make sure you tune in next week. And on that note, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.